Let's go one level above and look at the EU as a market. And I, I, I take it that you are actively involved in the MIFID um, um, initiative. Um, across Europe, there's this desire amongst regulators to see greater harmonization, yes. um, greater price control. Uh, you know, if, I'm not sure if it's price destruction, but at least the regulators want to have a say in, in how prices are set in, in terms of financial services and, and, and trading of financial instruments. And, um, and I take it that they would like to see consolidation taking place in Europe, or, or they'd like to facilitate consolidation. Would I be correct to interpret MIFID as core propositions as being these? Yeah, in, in Europe we tend to refer to MIFID as MIFID. MIFID, yes. And um, it, it is interesting to see whether that leads to more harmonization or to more fragmentation. Uh, because um, what I think was in itself a very good idea with MIFID, we also wanted to uh, promote more competition between stock exchanges. But uh, in the end, what actually happens is and what we see is that there, there, there are many. Uh, there is some consolidation, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, Euro Next is a very good example yes. uh, of that. At the same time, we see a lot of alternative yes. uh, markets coming up, yes. stock exchanges coming up, which creates another unregulated. Demon. Yes, right. Creates another demon on the others. And right. and while we see that the current crisis that we are in is a, 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 to a great extent. Uh, a crisis of the OTC market, yes. shadow banking, in transparency. We see in, in transparency increasing in the stock exchange uh, in, 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 the, in the securities market uh, right. in, 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 in Europe. So we are uh, actually getting very concerned about that uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, right. What is, your, and also my what, what is your personal position on OTC? Um, and uh, the importance of an alternative and a multilateral market operating alongside the uh, regulated market? Well, I think it is very good that we uh, uh, promoted competition. Tariffs came down. Um, most stock exchanges were monopolies or near monopolies, and they made very huge profits. And it's healthy that there is more competition. Um, but um, now what we are getting increasingly concerned about fragmentation and in increasing in transparency which in the long run might be unfavorable to investors because it might lead to uh, raising of spreads right. and not getting the right price. So um, the jury is still out about MIFID. The other element of MIFID that I'd like to touch on is, is the um, interference of regulators in terms of how services are priced and, and your desire to see greater price reduction or well we we don't are not concerned with that so much uh, that that's more a matter of the competition authorities uh, obviously what we are concerned about is maximum transparency and we always believe that maximum transparency would lead to smaller margins right how much work is being done in harmonization in standardization between the different exchanges and um, you know what is your goal what are your goals in place for that um, well we We've We've already provided we, yes, we, we, we have provided a level playing field um, uh, and, and, and a possibility of more uh, competition. Now we have to take a closer look if we see unintended consequences such as less uh, transparency and if it will be revised in 2010. Right. I'm sure we'll do something. What is the data showing you right now? Do you see greater uh, liquidity, greater um, uh, trading? Oh, well, obviously, liquidity has increased uh, tremendously in Europe as a result of the. Uh, who are the winners in, 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 in? Who are the beneficiaries? Uh, are the smaller markets benefiting from this at the expense of the larger ones? Um, well, obviously, uh, the British market has increased uh, tr tremendously. Uh, so Somehow, the London seems to be still the, it is the uh, net uh, beneficiary of all markets. We have a giant sucking sound there. Right. And, uh, which is due to the, 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 the economies of scale of, of the London market and uh, the fact that uh, they have, uh, they're an English-speaking uh, country. And nevertheless, we, we have to see what happens now in, uh, in, in the continent. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the crisis has severely affected the city. Um, I also think that um, uh, the crisis will call for more regulation and stricter regulation, 
the uh, Lord Turner, the uh, uh, chairman of the FSA, has already said the days of light touch regulation are over. Mm -hmm. Might result also in a more level playing field in terms of supervision in Europe. So we'll see what happens. Okay. In your role as the co-chairman of the Financial Crisis Advisory Group, yes. I, I find this group very exciting because they they touch on institutions across the different areas yes. of financial services. And the fact that you're Dutch, where you, you are, your, your country is home to ING and, and several universal banking models. Um, what is your belief of, in terms of the concept of too big to fail um, and, and of financial institutions becoming more and more complex as opposed to the previous US model, which was to you know, separate the different business lines? Well, I'm, this is not really my line of business. So uh, I might have some private ideas about that, but the, these are not uh, official points of view. This is more a question of, for the prudential regulators. Uh, I believe that the major cause of the crisis was the over-leveraging of the banking system as a whole. Uh, the fact that many banks had were leveraged 30 times, 40 times, 50 times over, which is unprecedented in, in history. That is generally recognized. Bringing that leverage down will do a lot to uh, reduce risks in the future. Uh, then again, you might. What what I think the, the discussion about what business models do we accept in the banking sector uh, sector has not crystallized uh, fully. Yeah, I I, asked and, and I, I I wonder if we should not think about that more structurally than has been the case mm. this far. I asked you this question because um, I cannot imagine a financial crisis advisory group. Um, dealing with some of the responses without without having to answer this question. Well, this this, this group specifically dealt with accounting issues. Uh, we the, the, it was an advisory group to the IASB and, and, uh, and FASB, and it was mainly talking about accountancy issues, which I never and thought I never thought accountancy could be so uh, so exciting. But what is the relationship like between the FASB and the IASB? Um, you know the American way of thinking about you know some of these issues and and the European. Well, I have discovered that uh, basically uh, the philosophy of the two institutions is very uh, cl uh, close to each other, and they are firmly committed to convergence worldwide or to a worldwide set of standards for accountancy. But still, the Americans tend to use the Congress as an excuse for not subscribing to some of the... Um, you know. Well, yeah, and uh, what we've seen in the crisis is that there has been a lot of political pressure on the accounting standard setting uh, procedures, uh, which was not very helpful, I, uh, I believe. We did not just see that in the United States, we saw that there too, but not exclusively. Also in Europe, there was a lot of pressure on the IASB. Uh, I believe if we want to go to uh, a, a worldwide uh, accountancy standards, which I think would be hugely beneficial, beneficial to the capital markets, uh, we need to have professional independent standard setters that of course will have to take into account what the outside world thinks, but that can do its uh, work without undue political pressure. Right. Give us an update in terms of the valuation standards debate taking place within the uh, financial crisis advisory. Well, we, you know, uh, this, this, this group um, had huge uh, proponents of fair value accounting and very much critical uh, people of, of fair value accounting. Interesting, and, and in the beginning the, our discussions went all over the place and I was highly worried that we couldn't Come reach a go. consensus. But we did finally reach some consensus in the fact that we said, well listen, even if you think that fair value accounting led to an understating of the value, of the true value of some financial assets. That may be the case. Then it's also true that the majority of banking assets are still traditional loans that are not valued at fair value but at historic cost. And that probably, most probably, the value of those assets have, have been overstated, that, that there are still a lot of hidden losses mm. in the loan portfolios of right. most banks. But the banking industry also had uh, another problem. Actually, you, you saw this in countries where the banking crisis did not originate from. They, they bought some of these assets and, and held them off balance sheet. 
um, you know, and, yes. and there's trading assets basically. So you had two banking crises. You had one in the U.S., which the, the you know the assets were on yeah. the books, and and one in the rest of the world where it was off balance sheet. Yes, that was a big problem. I think if accountancy practices can be blamed for something, then it is especially the question. taking advantage of in the question, Yes, question of of uh, keep being able to keep uh, things out assets outside the books. And uh, that was especially the case in the United States, much less so under the ISB uh, regime. So what's the position now uh, in the FCA, FCAG on off-balance sheet? That, we, that those rules have to be tightened up quite considerably and that, ha that is being done at this very moment. Mr. Hansko, thank you very much for your time. Okay.